My name is David James Duncan. This is my friend, Aquifer, sculpted by my wife, Adrian Arleo. This talk is for the Bedrock Lectures on Human Rights and Climate Change. The title, The Heart of the Monster, is the name of a remarkable pile of basalt rubble on the lower Clearwater River in Idaho. But before I get to that, thanks to every lecturer in the series. I've listened, grateful for your witness, your truth-telling, your expertise, your defiance. I'm honored to be part of this. That said, here goes. According to the Nez Perce people, that big pile of basalt rubble by their river, the heart of the monster, is literally the dead heart of a monster so gigantic and insatiable that it once devoured every creature on earth, ending the last age of the world. But the monster's last bite proved fateful. It ate Coyote, who planned on being eaten. In his fur, he'd hidden flints and obsidian blades. When he washed down the gullet into the monster's innards, Coyote found all the devoured creatures still alive but damned hungry. So he got busy with his flints and started a fire under the monster's heart. When the heart began dripping fat and brown flesh and smoke came pouring out the monster's mouth and nose, the starving creatures built the fire bigger and tucked into a colossal barbecue. Coyote, meanwhile, got busy with his blades, slicing away at the aorta and arteries until the heart tore loose, the monster fell dead and vanished. The animals and birds found themselves returned to the world and the heart alone fell to earth by the lower clear water where it cooled into the eerie pile of basalt rubble we still see today. Strange and wonderful to relate the same basalt pile as the Nez Perce people's creation point. Out of dead heart rubble, the Nez Perce and other peoples emerged and the current age of the world began. I named this talk the heart of the monster because in 2010, this myth repeated itself when the Nez Perce, the Pacific Northwest, the entire Earth, once you factor in climate change, faced another monster, and this one had accomplices. One was Exxon Mobil, five more, the apparently insane Supreme Court judges who had bequeathed us the legal fiction known as the corporate person in the case Citizens United. This lunatic betrayal of the Founding Fathers and the Constitution enabled lifeless financial entities to pour millions into brainwashing the electorate in support of politicians sworn to serve not living beings but corporate bottom lines. Washington was soon flooded by a new kind of Paul who was little more than a placeless, neighborless carpetbagger. Here's Wendell Berry. A corporation is essentially a pile of money to which a number of persons have sold their moral allegiance. It can experience no personal hope or remorse, no change of heart. It cannot humble itself. Its single purpose is to become a bigger pile of money." End quote. Lawmakers elected by the pulseless, soulless corporate person for eight years now have been devastating democratic institutions, living ecosystems, and the state of our shattering union for maximum profit, all else be damned. The darkness engendered is daunting as hell. We're in the midst of having our world enormously reduced and our hearts repeatedly broken, not by humans who've remained human, but by a dehumanized, banking and industry-led destruction that's building toward an unimaginable climax. But alongside this terrible tension, to get down to my own bedrock, I keep experiencing an uncanny power in our heart's very brokenness because many hearts don't just break, they break open. I love trying to imagine what Mother Teresa was feeling the day she said, may God break my heart so completely that the whole world falls in. I love her saying, when I finally see Jesus, I'll tell him I loved him in the dark. 
I love those who continue to love in darkness and broken openness. I think of the resistance at Standing Rock. I think of Emma Gonzalez. People with all the truth and none of the power facing down those with none of the truth and all the power. That kind of integrity doesn't just break me. It breaks me open. The corporate bedrock at Standing Rock was money, of which Jesus said, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. Against that, the tribe stood by the truth, water is life. And I tasted Isaac Dennison's words, The cure for anything is salt water, sweat, tears, the sea. Some guidance I've gleaned from wandering the wilds of this earth in the pages of wisdom literature for 50 years. In the end, we're all renters, not owners. Those who believe they own the earth die bodily, but not spiritually, suddenly own nothing and suffer the effects of the ownership delusion. George Saunders' Tibetan Buddhist novel, Lincoln and the Bardo, is a gorgeous illustration of this. Once spiritual consequence becomes our light, saints, bodhisattvas, displaced Tibetan sages, tribal elders, and holy fools know so many things that disembodied corporate disinformation machines do not know that their hoo-ha becomes a white noise that doesn't distract us from our true purposes for more than a few seconds. Once spiritual consequence becomes our light, the central struggle is against cosmic illusion. All creatures in their pre-existing forms have been divine life forever, Meister Eckhart. All blame is best driven into oneself, Dogen. All solace lies in the soul's indestructibility, Krishna. The law of karma is our impartial judge and inexorable fate and the justice unleashed upon our posthumous spirits after a skein of profitable investments in, say, sweatshops, terminator seeds, cyanide mines, fracking, tar sands, TV disinformation machines, and bogus derivatives, may, of salvific necessity, lead us through the darkest of bardos to a short, brute incarnation as a paint huffer trapped in one of the hell holes our financial triumphs helped create. Once spiritual consequence becomes our light, the first noble truth is suffering. The last frontier is unassailable bliss. Our enemies become our teachers. Sinners are as likely to be shot through with light as with lead. And a river spliced mountain meadow might telescope down into the heart of a modest sized visitor, enclosing her in a presence that turns her into a stunned and grateful feature of her own interior vastness. Feeling all that, committed lifelong to that, I feel like a hypocrite admitting that when ExxonMobil took aim at our wild peace place and everything I consider holy lay in their path, I felt nothing for days but alternating rage and despair. It turned out Exxon and its Canadian clone, Imperial Oil, had for years been fast-tracking the conversion of 1,100 miles of northwest riverways and scenic byways into what they called a high and wide industrial corridor connecting the Alberta tar sands to the industrial nations of the Pacific Rim. If Exxon succeeded, those nations could ship gigantic hell gear through our region to convert one of the great lungs of the earth the arboreal forests of Canada, into this. To speed the process, the largest industrial objects ever to cross the Pacific were already being transferred to river barges in Portland, Vancouver, then hoving up the Columbia and Snake Rivers to Lewiston, Idaho. These so-called megaloads, 230 feet long, three stories high, weighing 600,000 to 700,000 pounds, would then creep for 600 miles along roads and bridges built for maximum 80,000 pound loads along three designated wild and scenic rivers over two mountain ranges up the eastern front of the Rockies to Canada. 
ExxonMobil's political clout would ratify the failed Lower Snake River dams and bankrupt Lewiston Port for the barging route, which had already driven the Interior West's once massive salmon population to near extinction and doomed the orcas of southern Puget Sound to starve for lack of salmon. This transformation would continue for as long as the men who gave us the tar sands, rampant fracking, and the Prince William Sound oil spill deemed profitable. Megaloads have many times crashed on level four-lane highways in Canada by simply breaking the steel of their trailers. Here, they would travel serpentine byways in the dead of winter, sending out unprecedented vibrations in avalanche zones that have swept semi-trucks into the rivers, once three at a time. No crane on earth could pull them out. Exxon's assurances to the contrary are backed by a history of environmental debacles, human rights atrocities, criminal convictions, junk climate science. Idaho's wilds are intimate to me. One example, my writings in life somehow made me the half-honored, half-shattered recipient of vials of the ashes of four boys age 11 to 18 told by their parents to release the molecules in a beautiful place. I chose the road Exxon had now targeted to reach the tiny cirque stream in this photo. I stood in that meadow, wilderness in all directions as far as the eye can see, recited the best prayer I know, and when I poured <clears throat> When I poured out the boy's ashes, a wind, an uncanny wind roared down, feeling like the prayer's answer. I walked baffled alongside what I now wanted to call the beautiful sight of freed boy atoms flowing away. By the time the atoms reached the lock saw, they were enveloped in this. By the time a few atoms reached the Pacific, they might resurrect as water vapor, travel inland in a cloud bank, and fall as rain. To unite again with the prayer wheel that is a river's true sky and land based journey. After selling the clean, safe fracking lie to the world, <clears throat> Rex Tillerson joined in a lawsuit to try to stop a fracking tower near his Barton, Texas ranch because it would devalue his property. What would his company's conversion of the National Historic Nez Perce Trail of Tears, the Lewis and Clark Trail, a wilderness and kayaker's paradise, and the wild peace place to which I'd entrusted four boys' ashes due to our values? The financial winners of the hijacking would be the richest corporation on earth. American taxpayers would help subsidize Exxon's costs at the same time they were gouging us with doubled gas prices after the financial crash of 2008. The governors of Idaho and Montana showed what they were made of by granting Exxon permission to conduct its own environmental and economic impact assessment with no public input. In September 2010, we learned the first megaloads were coming in December. <laughs> Knowing I must raise the alarm within 12 weeks to beat Exxon to the punch, I called Orion Magazine and learned the lead time on a story was six months. Called outside and the lead time was four months. But Montana-based activists had formed a group, All Against the Hall, who scrambled to set themselves up as a publisher that would produce a single book. The book would be written by Rick Bass and me. I was to cover the Megalodes effect on everything from the mouth of the Columbia to the Canadian border. Rick would cover the political fallout in Montana. With the help of photographer Frederick Oringer, researcher Steve Hawley, book designer Ian Boyden, we set out to write, fact check, edit, illustrate, design, and publish a book in seven weeks. 
wait three weeks as it was printed, then rush it to reviewers, activist groups, bookstores, and every conceivable medium a week or two before ExxonMobil hijacked our rivers and roads. By the time I read Andrew Nikiforic's great depressing book, Tar Sands, and learned of Exxon's power over regional politicians, I was feeling so low, I could only begin a work day by setting up a spiritual practice. For an hour each morning, I purged myself with words that touched me at a soul deep level. For instance, two sentences by Antonio Portia, translated by W.S. Merwin. To wound the heart is to create it. I am chained to the earth to pay for the freedom of my eyes. I no longer remember how the hell our team met our deadline. I drove the manuscript through a blizzard over two mountain passes. Ian and I designed the book in two days, mailed it to the printer. When I arrived home completely exhausted, my little practice of giving the project to an unseen, unborn perfection every morning and night blossomed into one of the great spiritual experiences of my life. No time to tell that story. But in this beautiful place, by the grace of powers no words can name, the nightmare didn't happen. Four trial shipments were the extent of the invasion. All four were nightmares to big oil. The energy of the Idle No More movement in Canada carried down to our region. A fantastic citizen group fighting Goliath rose up and raised holy heaven on the Idaho side. Our book, Heart of the Monster, roused the rabble far and wide. Rising tide activists locked themselves to mega loads. Citizen monitors tracked the loads up to Clearwater, filming and journaling the laws broken and problems encountered. Grandmothers occupied the route in Missoula, delaying the modules, embarrassing the cops who arrested them. The Nez Perce occupied their home highway with their bodies, blocking a mega load, making national headlines. Mother Nature threw down a brutal winter that delayed every shipment. The last mega load was my favorite. A gargantuan blue rectangle filled with Satan knows what bashed a cliff face on its first night, crushing a corner for all to see. A very successful run, said Exxon Imperial. Two nights later, the giant blue box knocked out power to 1,300 Idaho homes and businesses. Another model run, said Exxon. But by the time the box got delayed by freak snowstorms, illegally blocked a river access for 12 days crept over the Bitterroot Mountains and pulled off the highway at Lolo Hot Springs. A Montana judge banned it from ever getting back on the highway. A federal judge in Idaho then wrapped things up by finding the Forest Service guilty of malfeasance for not protecting wild and scenic rivers in the first place. Exxon Imperial's last 33 megaloads were stranded in Lewiston. They had to send 2,000 workers to slice the modules into much smaller units capable of traveling normal interstate highways. The cost of conversion was $500 million per module. Exxon Imperial's eventual cost overruns at the Tar Sands project totaled $2 billion, a big chunk of which was left lying along the wild and scenic river route that Time Magazine dubbed the Northwest's thin green line, this line, and the line held. The last big rectangle, meanwhile, was outside two armed guards 24-7 and remained at Lolo Hot Springs for 13 months, becoming a beloved tourist attraction known as Babe the Blue Box. <laughs> but despite the armed guards' efforts, Babe got vandalized by an army of wilderness ninjas when Imperial opened the box a proliferation of spiders had reproduced by the thousands, overrunning Babe's innards, reminding me of Mary Oliver's lines. Someone I loved once gave me a box full of darkness. It took me years to understand that this, too, was a gift. Babe's gift to us was getting sold, up, sold for scrap. 
In her book, Teaching a Stone to Talk, Annie Dillard writes, it's madness to wear a lady's straw hat and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares and lashes to our pews where the sleeping God may wake, where the waking God draw us out to where we can never return. The silence is all there is. It is God's brooding over the face of the waters. It is the blinded note of the 10,000 things. You take a step in the right direction to pray to this silence and to address the prayer to world. Distinctions blur, quit your tents, pray without ceasing. Dear world and God, brooding over the face of the world's waters. By your grace and in the baseball lover Annie's honor, I pray you might allow this aged arm to teach a few stones not only to talk with water, but to walk on it beside this highway, reconsecrated to the task of carrying every American who loves you into the living heart of you. Amen.